Perfect. Hello, everyone. We're very happy to start this webinar today with our special guest, Richard Bivers, um, who I know now for a few months or even a year, um, and was a very knowledgeable person in the crypto space since many year and i'm also very happy that i have with me my co-host um demelsa hayes and um, so maybe um, i would just like to jump right in the center of our discussion uh, richard uh, tell us since how long you are in crypto and what did you do in the last few years so uh thanks Mark, for the kind introduction uh, nice to be here with you and Demelza. Um, so, yeah, I got into crypto uh, really in 2017. Um, it was after a long journey of um, exploration around uh, hard money substitutes. Um, I'd been in traditional finance and I had become very concerned with the financial system. I'd been buying gold from about 2009. And uh, I'd actually dismissed Bitcoin first in 2009 when a young kid on my desk uh, told me about it and said I should look at it. And I said, what is it? And he said, it's, it's a currency on the internet. And I said, well, it's probably a scam. You should leave it alone. And uh, that was my first dismissal, a very expensive dismissal of Bitcoin. Um, in 2017, I ended up reading the book Sapiens, uh, where I agreed with a lot of Hariri's ideas around the way the world was going and the changes we were likely to see. Um, and he kept mentioning Bitcoin and blockchain. <clears throat> and I was like, I don't understand why this guy, who's clearly credible, sensible guy, is talking about this scam on the internet. So at that point, I decided I needed to do a bit more work. And I started just tinkering around with it, buying it, uh, read the white paper, and realized there was something a lot more to this than just being uh, a scam on the internet. So that sort of fueled my journey into the industry. I invested in a cryptocurrency mining company that I later joined, and they were looking at expanding into financial services, which is why I joined them. And we went on a journey there, building an exchange, a custody uh, provider. We actually built a fund of crypto hedge funds all the way back in 2018, we started building that, um, launched it in 2019. And then when I joined Seeds Capital in 2022, uh, started the process to build a product that looked a lot like it, but was improved in many different facets. So that's a very short version of the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe I, 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 as I told you, we know us. I think since the very beginning, you came here to Switzerland. You do the, you're here now in Switzerland. Explain us a bit what you're doing here now, why you are here. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I was actually in Switzerland, sort of taking some time off after the uh, crypto company, and uh, I was having a good time with my family, reconnecting and uh, stuff. I'd been in Hong Kong before my kids lived in Switzerland. And so I came back and was, was hanging around here. And actually, in March, I got contacted by Mark Sees. So Mark Sees of the Sees family, Sees Bank. And Mark asked me if I'd consider joining him to run his uh, the hedge fund business of Sees Capital. So Sees Capital is the alternative investment arm of the entire Seeds group. We look at look after hedge funds, private equity, um, legal assets, so mitigation financing, thought firm lending. And I said, yes, that's definitely interesting, but one of the products we definitely would need to build would be a fund of crypto hedge funds because the alpha that exists in crypto is is quite remarkable. And so... Mark was already someone that had a good understanding of crypto and good understanding of hedge funds. The bank has a 28-year history of hedge fund selection. And so he said, that sounds great. We should definitely build that product. And uh, so then I joined in October. And I think I met you in October 
in Zug, uh, which was actually my first time ever in Zug. <laughs> and, uh, and someone had said, oh, you've got to meet Martin. Um, he's a key guy at Crypto Valley. You'll get on well. So that was uh, that was how we ended up meeting in Zug. And then uh, you told me what a great place it was. And so I ended up moving here. <laughs> Perfect. Great. Good to hear. Yeah, now maybe yeah, we we as as we have the title of our new or of, of, of this webinar, which is called the current state of crypto. I think we're now at a very interesting moment of crypto. Of course, I mean we all have seen rather difficult times. I would say the last uh, two years. Huh? With a with a, with a difficult crypto winter, uh, but still now, I mean, uh, the, the recent developments and also the last few months, I mean, Bitcoin still is now quite stable above its lows from end of last year, and especially now this week uh, was uh, very much um, uh, into the, I mean, there was strong uh, price signals and a strong hike in, in, in interest. So maybe just as a general what's general view on, on, on what happened the last few months and weeks, uh, where, how do you comment? Yeah, I think what we're now seeing in the price behavior of Bitcoin is something that's really a paradigm shift. Um, you've now seen Bitcoin completely decorrelate from the equity markets, from the bond markets, and is acting much more like a flight to safety asset. And I think this has been a very key criticism of Bitcoin from the traditional institutional investment community has been that, oh, Bitcoin just trades like a risk asset. It trades like NASDAQ. It trades like Tesla, whatever it might be. Um, you know, it's just another risk on asset. And it's obviously always hard to push back on an argument like that when you've seen two to three years of that exact behavior. And the, the point I always make to these type of investors is, yes, because that is now at the point of being adopted and traded by macro funds by CTA funds that are looking at it as a risk on asset. And so when you've got the majority of the capital that's trading that asset, trading it as if it's a risk asset, then of course it's going to trade like a risk asset. What's very interesting now, as I said, is it's broken that correlation and you're seeing it as very much a flight to safety. And this is something that you've had a lot of Bitcoiners talking about for a long time, myself included, is that, you know, your Bitcoin is your hedge against the failure of the financial system. And so when you're seeing the bond markets under this level of stress and you see Bitcoin have a rip of 15% to the upside, then suddenly people across the world are paying attention because this is not doing what anyone's expecting it to do uh, in the broad institutional base. And so we're probably moving into a, a different phase of Bitcoin's life and Bitcoin's maturity and development. Well, maybe I want to ask two more questions, and then I would like to hand over also to, to, to the males. I mean, you are you are with uh, Seeds Capital now. You started in July, uh, if I rem remember well, um, with uh, different products. I mean, with a uh, uh, funds, right? I mean, one fund of or fund of funds, basically, which you're doing with, with one is market neutral, the other one isn't. Um, uh, I think you're very, if I remember well, you're very. Analytics strong in the analytics. You do lots of on-chain analytics. Could you maybe share a bit what you see in the last few months? I mean, because we have some signals like, you know, many now in the Bitcoin, even now with price hikes, some were liquidating positions. I mean, on the other hand, I mean, they have to be more buyers than sellers. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a price hike. Uh, maybe also, how do you see it, you know, with the whales or non whales, how, what 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 do you see and what what can you share with us? Sure. So to, just to correct a couple of things, um, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Just to clarify, 
I joined Seas Capital a year ago. Uh, we launched a part of crypto hedge fund product on the 1st of July. It is one product. Um, the base of the product is uh, market neutral. So the idea is that this provides positive returns in any environment. That is what we, we seek to do. And in fact, many crypto investors invest in this product as, as a cash proxy, which for an institutional investor is a bit of a, a ridiculous uh, way to think about it. But because it is a, such a stable, low vol product, um, that is kind of the, the, the return profile that crypto investors see. So we target 25% IRR on an average through the cycle basis. So in a bear market, we're looking to get around 10 to 15%. And then in a bull market, we're looking at north of 35%. And that's played out. Obviously, I ran a fund very similar to this previously. That's played out through previous cycles. And that is exactly what we've seen with the portfolio funds that we put together today. So just to explain that, just to clarify the way that we construct the portfolio. So yes, to your point, we do leverage uh, one specific part of Alpha uh, that is particular to crypto, and that is that massive data set that is all the transactions that have ever gone through on every layer one blockchain. So as everyone listening to this call uh, knows, I assume, uh, every single transaction and the wallet originating and the wallet receiving it is recorded for eternity in the base layer of the particular blockchain mm -hmm. that is transacted on. That provides a massive data set for us to be able to analyze and see what is going on. And to your point, yes, there has been, we actually call this the reaccumulation phase. So we passed into the reaccumulation phase in March. That's when you start to see a few indicators like, for example, um, whales, you mentioned whales, or wallets that are generally selling at the top of the market and then buying back at the bottom of the market. Um, they have been in accumulation since about March now. And so this is very typical. You get this sort of flat chop along at, and to the point where you obviously are moving into the halving cycle as well. So the market is normally quite stable. If you look back to the previous period, we were stuck at 10,000. Uh, for for much of 2018 and 19, um, and so on an average basis, you're kind of at 10,000. For us, this cycle, our average basis is around 30,000, and so we've been kind of chopping around that. And now we, with what we're seeing on chain, we expect that um, we will be moving into the bull cycle um, fairly soon. Obviously, the halving is coming in April. That's often a driver of the bull cycle because you know the market's got used to taking out that daily supply. But today it's 900 Bitcoin for an equivalent amount of dollars in to the 30,000 level. And then obviously that supply halves, but the same amount of dollars are coming in on the dollar cost, averaging um, daily buying. And so you get generally a jerk reaction, not immediately. Normally it's a bit post, it's all remaining supply gets eaten up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, then, uh, and then you generally move into the bull cycle a uh, few months after the halving. Um, we actually think that we'll see the bull cycle start a little bit earlier this time, um, largely because, you know, people have seen it happen three times. Um, they probably will not wait um, and probably start to front run the halving. Um, you're seeing the hash rate um, of mining go to all-time highs. Um, we are at ridiculous levels in terms of ether hash um, for mining. And so anyone that's not mining with very cheap electricity and very up-to-date equi equipment is getting priced out of the market now. And it seems to be uh, thanks to a lag of delivery times of the new equipment that have been coming um, the order lag time is normally one to two years for some of this, you know, very high end S19s. Um, so that is has pushed the hash rate. Um, and as I say, normally, you know, you see a follow of the price to the hash rate. So 
that is also um, implying that we will see the bull market come earlier than we normally do in the in the general cycle. One more thing to to mention about on chain, um, you know, allocating to hedge funds and being able to produce a twenty five percent IRR is fantastic, but the problem is you do have risks. And FTX in two thousand twenty two November showed us the risk that you can have by having a hedge fund portfolio. The majority of hedge funds had exposure to FTX. And so they ended up with balances lost on FTX. And so one of the things that we built um, actually for approval from the C's group board to allow us to move ahead with this product was an hourly monitoring system of all the underlying exchanges wallets for the key layer one blockchains. We monitor Bitcoin, we monitor ETH, we monitor USDC and USDT of all the key exchanges on an hourly basis. Um, and then we inform our manager if we see any major changes. We did actually, um, just to tell you a story on that one, uh, two days after launching our fund, we actually got our first major red flag, which was Huobi, the Chinese exchange. Um, their Bitcoin balances dropped by 50% over a 24-hour period. And so we contacted all our managers. Um, this was about 4 a.m. U.S. time. And, of course, the one manager with exposure was based in the U.S. Um, but by 7.30 a.m., he'd managed to get his balances off Huobi. Um, we found out five weeks later in the news that um, Huobi had had some issues with the Chinese police and the Chinese police had been questioning uh, employees, which had been clearly leading to panic and people withdrawing their balances. And if you weren't in the know, then you didn't know what was going on. Um, but uh, the market found out five weeks later, and we'd obviously alerted our managers uh, the minute we saw it on chain. So it does give us a nice edge, we feel, in constructing portfolio. Good. Yeah, but maybe just to our admin, I don't know. I've, I've just received the message here that apparently people are having troubles in getting into the our event here. Oh dear! Did we? Did do you hear some? Do you see? Um, the one the Zoom link I received. Uh, Christina Adams told me that the Zoom link she received is invalid, but I don't know. Okay, I will check our info email. But we have people coming in, so the link is Probably, working. Okay, good, 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 perfect. If it's if it's, I just wanted to make sure <laughs> that, it, that we're not just the three of us discussing here. The very interesting stuff. Great. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Good. At the mail, so maybe um, I would like to hand over to you. Sure. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Richard, for joining us today. Um, and, and thank you for the introduction and, and kind of uh, bring us up to speed with what you're working on with C's Capital. So mm -hmm. I had a question. Um, I, as you, um, I don't know if you mentioned on this podcast or on the podcast you did with Relay and Yulian, but you mentioned that uh, this new fund of funds was in collaboration with Willy Wu. So yeah. I'm just curious. Um, yeah, like how... How do you guys select what funds to invest in? And also, when I read the press release about the the fund of funds, I, I think it mentioned that it was it was crypto investing in crypto in general, and not only Bitcoin. Um, so, are you investing in in funds that are are are, are op like open in terms of what you know the underlying universe, or only Bitcoin strategies? A uh, great question. Yeah, no, look, William and I are, are Bitcoiners, obviously, and uh, but uh, the opportunity with crypto is that there's a huge amount of alpha. The alpha comes from volatility. It comes from actually the very high volume at periods of distress when exchanges are going down and spreads get really wide. Um, it comes from the fragmentation of the liquidity pool. Um, you know, there's 30 uh, viable exchanges, I would say, where you can actually trade proper volume. You know, if you think back to the hedge fund days of the 80s and 90s, you know, the, the, 
the early arbitrage hedge funds were trading across two or three exchanges. Here you've got 30 exchanges. Um, so it presents a huge amount of opportunity, um, I would say, uh, on the alpha side. And look, Willie, you know, I'm sure many people uh, here know who Willie is. Willie's a data guy. So, you know, Willie is absolutely obsessed with, you know, looking at the different data sets on chain, but also within the performance of managers as well um, to try and, you know, construct optimal portfolios. You know, we came together with this partnership because Willie and the team at CMCC were very keen to create something that they were, what they refer to as the freedom fund i.e. money where they can just park and know that it will just gently keep accreting higher um, because obviously all their exposure is in Bitcoin and, and crypto. Um, we came at it from a, a different approach and actually even before I joined, the hedge fund team were looking at crypto because in the traditional hedge fund business, it's always hard and you're always looking for new sources of alpha. And so the returns that were being made crypto meant that that was becoming more and more interesting for a hedge fund allocator. And so it was really just a, a meeting of the two needs. You know, we had the need to be able to read that blockchain data. Willie's obviously one of the pioneers of doing that. And they needed someone to help them understand the risk of investing in hedge funds, be they crypto or traditional hedge funds. Um, and so it came together. Uh, thanks to um, Mark Sees, who, who knew both parties and uh, got us all connected. And so we started working on the project as, literally as soon as I walked in the door. Um, so it was it was perfect because when I when I spoke to Mark about it, he goes, I know just the guys we need to speak to. And that's how we ended up working uh, with Willie Wu. But uh, yes, crypto, you know, many of the people, it's very interesting, many of the fund managers that we invest in They've moved from traditional finance because they've been attracted by the really elevated alpha that you have in crypto that you really don't see so much of in the traditional markets. And so, you know, you may have a purist thought about Bitcoin um, as we do, um, but there is a huge amount of alpha available in the trading strategies around this entire asset class. So, yeah, I think that's the same answer I gave to you. Julian, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. No, that's great. Um, I was just curious how, also in the interview with Julian, you said that you are a Bitcoin maxi yourself, and then you mentioned that here. So how, how did you come to, to that um, outlook as opposed to kind of somebody that also is interested in Ethereum or, you know, you, stable coins or NFTs or some other sec securitized uh, stocks or something yeah. else on the blockchain? So I'm, I would say, I would caveat it, and that was something that uh, we discussed with Julian, is that I'm not a toxic Bitcoin maximalist in that I'm not going to scream at people for trying to invest in other cryptos. Um, I'd say there is the potential that other crypto will produce um, all sorts of interesting things. And I think NFTs can be very interesting for things like, you know, documentation, home deeds, these sorts of things, your university certificates, which I always have to try and apply for every time that I'm, you know, joining something that I need to get hold of those payment uh, documents. I need to go and reapproach my university as a complete pain. If I had them in an NFT, it would be super convenient, of course. So I think there are a number of implementations of crypto that can be useful. The reason that I describe myself as a Bitcoin maxi is because when someone asks me what crypto should I be investing in, I will say Bitcoin and don't do anything else. If they insist on doing something else, I will say, listen, you are at a massive information and informational disadvantage to the crypto VCs that, that operate in this space. You are the exit liquidity if you end up trying to play that game. So either you really need to know the project inside out, or if you have to touch crypto, then invest in it via a crypto VC. Pay them the two and 20, it's worth the money. They will do very well in a bull market. 
they get to invest in Solana cents on the dollars, and you know they're they're selling it out into the furor of the bull market. But you know, often what happens is people come with a sort of oh I've seen crypto it's going up what crypto should I invest in and um, Bitcoin only really it it has to be Bitcoin only Bitcoin from my perspective is the only asset within this asset class that has proved itself that has proved utility that is used all across the world um, and you know as we discussed earlier it's proving to be a flight to safety asset in the problems that we're now witnessing in the banking sector in the bond market um i wouldn't like to be an equity investor right now that sounds scary as hell um so you know bitcoin you know it makes a lot of sense does other crypto make a lot of sense yes but really for me you're then investing in vc high octane vc because sure some of these projects will do really well but some of them are just gonna do lose all the money and the thing I get concerned about for Ethereum, particularly because everyone looks at Ethereum and says, oh, well, Ethereum, you know, it's also a very blue chip asset in crypto. Well, Ethereum's losing market share on the stable coins, is losing market share on pretty much every other new protocol that's coming. If you think about gaming, Solana's taking so much of its market share there. You know, <clears throat> I think that the change that we saw with the move to proof of stake. I don't think it was a very sensible move. Um, I think that constantly tweaking the base layer protocol is problematic if people want to be building on it and making such a big change when I think there's a lot of value to proof of work. And, you know, we can talk about that as a whole different subject. But moving from proof of work to proof of stake just makes Ethereum, from a monetary perspective, um, a little bit like the fiat system that we're dealing with, where the biggest controllers of the money get to make the decisions on the protocol, which I don't think anyone came here for. That's not why we're in crypto, right? So I think for me, I, I'm very concerned about how much value potentially Ethereum can lose um, because it's up against a whole load of potentially very promising protocols that are, you know, you look Tron, uh, you know, I'm not saying Tron is any kind of good asset or protocol, but Tron, Tron-based tether is the main tether that is required all across the developing world because it has lower fees than Ethereum. So now the majority of tether, I believe, is now on actually on Tron, um, and that's a huge asset base. So you know, 80 billion, I think, last time I checked on tether. So, you know, Ethereum slowly losing market share in these pockets, I think it's got a long way to fall. Um, I'd be concerned. Well, that's that's fascinating uh, point of view you have there. Yeah, I mean, I, I work at Cointelegraph um, and I also manage a small fund in Zurich. And um, I, I, you mentioned Huobi earlier and Huobi, I don't know, is it, I don't know if it's public or not, but Huobi is is owned by Tron, like Justin Sun. It's the same group of people. And so we 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 do different things with both of them at Cointelegraph because they're always doing marketing and everything. But um like you said with the the scare with the police, like I got out of Tron because of the scare around Justin Sun uh when he got arrested I think like earlier in March of this year or something. But I, but but Tron did have a good year, um, you know, and like you said, the the, the US, USDT on Tron is is the largest one. So I know I, I've I, I'm a big fan of Ethereum, but you're right, there are a lot of red flags popping up um, more more so now since it switched to to proof of stake. Well, yeah, that's great. So um, thanks a lot for your feedback on that. When when you mentioned the bond market breaking, um, I was curious, like what what do you think is going to break first before the, the central banks kind of decide we need to pivot? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, what unemployment level does Jerome Powell need to see? How bad does the bond market need to be? Um, yeah, I, I don't know if you've been following the last 48 hours, but Xi Jinping made a historical visit to the PBOC um, and also uh, to CIC, as in the, the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Um, the 
the implication is that he is now doing everything to support the Chinese economy from a financial perspective. And you've seen very clear national team buying um, in, into the market. Um, so spiky, very spiky futures market into the open Chinese markets. So um, there is obviously a lot of back channeling with China and the US. And I believe that China, as much as the politicians that are trying to get elected are going to be trying to force the Fed to pivot as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, Powell, for his credibility perspective, is trying to hold out as long as he can. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're starting to see things break now, is concerned. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I've heard some some Bitcoiners say that because of the, the 8% interest rates in the U.S. basically um, on mortgages and 8% on, on various like bank loans for consumers and stuff, that they think that the new bull run is going to be a bit subdued because uh, of how high interest rates are around the world. Um, but on the other hand, like you said, there's so many signals like all-time high hash rate. Um, this is the third time, so maybe traders will start to price it in early. Um, so where do you think we're going to be at like by the end of this year? Uh, like, if you have any, <laughs> any thoughts on the, on the way it's going? Uh, look, it, it could be anywhere. Um, we know um, to try and make a two-month prediction is very, very hard. Um, but I think, you know, I, I overstated my prediction for the previous bull market. And so I, I, I try to not make predictions for the market uh, at this uh, anymore. But what I will say is, and I said this to, because what day was it when everything rallied like crazy? I think it was Sunday. So Monday morning, obviously, phone's ringing, everybody's calling, oh, should I buy Bitcoin? Do you think Bitcoin's still an interesting trade? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I said to everybody that called me, I said, listen, Bitcoin under 200,000 is a massive discount. So that's just where it is. That's just how I feel about it. I think that if you look at any metric, that puts it at about 40% of gold's market cap at 200,000. I would say, as many people do, that the digital version of gold is like, you know, Bitcoin is gold and fiat combined. I.e. it takes the superpowers of both, combines them into one. The key problem with gold and the reason that it failed as a, as a secure, as a, you know, uh, a final hard money was because of the portability problem, right? You ended up having to store all that gold in a safe place. And so it, it came under the purview of, you know, Fort Knox and, uh, and others. And therefore, it got centralized. We ended up with the fiat regime. And fiat is obviously electronic. So it's ultimately portable. But now Bitcoin combines both those attributes with ultimate scarcity. So I think that a 40% valuation of gold is probably um, a fairly uh, conservative view of where Bitcoin should be at this point in time. And yeah, you asked the question about interest rates. Do, do you really care at that point? about where interest rates are when you've got this asset that is completely unique. We've got, what is it, 19.5 million of the 21 million have already been issued. They're already being held. And I think 74% of them have not moved in over a year. So you have a supply. And when the halving comes, you're going to get that knee-jerk reaction once again um, you mentioned Relay, I speak to their OTC desk fairly regularly to just get an idea of how much flow they're taking. And when you combine them and Swan and Coinbase's program and all the DCAs, and we kind of we, we try and monitor how much it seems to be consistent buying a Bitcoin on chain, because someone like Relay goes to their own wallet directly, which is fantastic. So you can sort of see all those dollar cost averaging wallets. And so you can create clusters around there. We estimate that about 28,000 Bitcoin a month are bought through DCA platforms. 
which means that's the entire supply of Bitcoin is being bought every month by DCA. Um, and then you combine Tether. Tether's buying, we estimate, about 30 Bitcoin per day with their profits. Michael Saylor's buying about three Bitcoin a day with his profits. And El Salvador's buying one Bitcoin a day. Those are the only institutions and sovereigns we know about. So you combine that with these daily stackers and, you know, a lot of people are starting to wake up that this is a truly finite asset, uh, ultimately scarce commodity. Um, that is, you know, there's only 1.5 million left to be issued. And as I'm sure you know, Denaza, that takes another 117 years. So we are going to be fighting over that remaining uh, issuance. I know. What a good point. I mean, listening to you makes me want to go out and buy Bitcoin right away. <laughs> like, <laughs> like finish, finish this call and go buy Bitcoin. Um, but, but I, I agree. I, as a young person, I mean, I'm not that young anymore, but I, I, I'm not much into buying gold. I mean, I, I used to buy gold um, when, when I was before I knew a lot about Bitcoin and when I was interested in Austrian economics, but ever since I found out about Bitcoin, I just buy Bitcoin instead of gold. So, so people like me are, are definitely, you know, Bitcoin is taking gold's lunch away from, mm -hmm. I think, a lot of young mm -hmm. investors that could DCA into gold or Bitcoin. I think they're they're choosing Bitcoin. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, Martin, did you have some more thoughts for Richard? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's very interesting to listen to your to your um, to your discussion. And um, I mean, maybe I mean, what I what I what I was wondering and what I what I wanted to discuss also, also it's a question regarding Bitcoin. I mean, what will happen now with the halving? You know, let's say we are we have now, as I, as far as I know, we have quite many miners which are under stress. You no, know, which I mean, they don't really earn a lot with the current Bitcoin price and the energy price and and, and the supply. And, and uh, you told us before the. Uh, the equipment you need. Uh, um, what what will happen if maybe there are too many miners which you know go out of business and we have just the very very few ones? What do you see here, Richard? Well, look, it's uh, an ultimately self um, self cleansing market, right? Only the fittest survive, and unless you've got the cheapest access to electricity, unless you've got the best equipment, it is going to be very hard for you coming into the halving unless we see a price pop. So, you know, you get that natural selection every every halving. Uh, we see a massive amount of miners going out of business post the bull run. So the bull run happens and then you get often a, a very big pullback. I'm not convinced that we'll see the same level of pullback this time, but I'm also not convinced that we'll see the same level of rally sort of we're maturing into this so you're likely to get less pronounced um rallies and uh pullbacks um but yeah i we we see it every cycle martin it, it's it's very violent um normally um i would suggest that the violence will become less um, many of these big miners are very well funded now um they're publicly listed companies they've got good war chests um and uh yeah they're they're um obviously very efficient in the negotiation of electricity you know we talk about the benefits of proof of work um one of the benefits of mining is that it can create grid stability for you know someone with very volatile requirements of electricity like the state of texas you know they have extremely hot summers they you know they do have storms that knock out um, a lot of uh, their uh, electrical capacity often. And so they have this very varied requirement and an increasing need at the peaks to have a huge electrical grid. But yeah. to build that out without the demand for 80% of the year is impossible. So yeah. what mining is allowing is just a, a continual user of electricity. Absolutely. And then drop off the grid. And I think, you know, this is this is very good for energy um, abundance in the yeah. world broadly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this has other implications, right? Yeah. You can 
say, okay, let's say I, I want to do a debt issuance and I'm a country with a debt problem, but I have huge abundant resources. Let's take Argentina, for, for example, right? Argentina has a huge amount of geothermal, huge amount of uh, hydro potential as well. And so if they started raising capital in a debt structure based on infrastructure bills, then they could probably alleviate themselves from a lot of the um, IMF debt that they find themselves choking under um, that has led to hyperinflation um, of those economies for, for many years. So I think that, that this can be an amazing tool to, to help propagate that future. And Bitcoin mining is extremely central to that because you know they can pay for the infrastructure, they can use Bitcoin mining to take the energy while they don't necessarily have full need for it um, and monetize it so that they can uh, pay off that debt. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's you on that. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, I, that's, that's, that's it. I, I know that this, this call is to discuss uh, funds and, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe it would be worthwhile just talking about some of the different strategies that we see. Yeah. Yeah. In crypto funds, if if that makes sense. Absolutely, I think I have one more question regarding <laughs> because I also regarding I mean, what you are what you are doing in the fund of fund basis, and mm -hmm. uh, and obviously very linked also to uh, you know financial institutions, its capital, you know, family which is in banking since very long time. Huh? It's one of the oldest banks in Switzerland, or a very old bank in Switzerland, multi-generations old and so on. So, one, of course, it's already interesting uh, uh, to see them moving into the space. And now I want to know also from your side, I mean, we have now this discussion like with BlackRock and many other um, companies uh, trying to, to get uh, um, um, a Bitcoin ETF uh, on start and um, uh, I'm, I'm wondering what do you think about this what will happen there and also maybe what's now in the interest what do you see now with your clients you know how is the interest from institutions is are they coming do you do you see a difference i mean we, we're talking about the, the institutional interest since quite some time but it, it didn't really it didn't really materialize until now do you see a change i mean with all having probably i mean you, you're in discussion about with fundraising maybe you could also elaborate on this yeah sure i mean what what has been interesting is obviously i think we were moving quite well towards institutional adoption until ftx happened and yeah. uh, you know, uh, a lot of the investors that got caught up in in FTX, you take some of, you had sovereign wealth funds that were invested with FTX. I mean, it really, not only did it leave them licking their wounds, it also left them with a lot of egg on their face um, and a lot of embarrassment. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's been a credibility punch for the industry. I would say that... Um, us coming into the industry has um, has been welcomed with open arms in the funds that we're investing in. So just to give you an understanding, every fund that we invest in, we negotiate on liquidity, we negotiate on capacity, and we negotiate on fees. And because, as you rightly say, we bring the credibility of a banking group into, into the fund, they're obviously, they're very keen for us to be an investor. Because you know we say that you can you can publicize that you can mention that we're an investor, but you know obviously we want extremely good terms for our investors. So that's that's obviously the quid pro quo. But to your point, I think that the credibility of having institutional investors in the space has been lacking since FTX, which is why we've been welcomed with with open arms, as I say, by these funds. But also now us being involved and us going out and raising capital um, has meant that we're speaking to a number of obviously family offices, but also small pensions, uh, insurers, um, and more institutional investors are like, okay, we've been wanting to look at 
crypto for some time. We now have a product that you're bringing, a uh, very low volatility product, but getting us access and understanding and able for us to dip the toe in the water. Um, and so that's that's a, a, a very nice piece of progress that we see firsthand um, with our conversations with investors. To your question about the ETF, um, look, I think this is the subject that everybody's been talking about in crypto. For what <laughs> yeah. feels like eternity, it's like, I guess it's only three months, but, um, you know, BlackRock getting involved is significant. Um, I was actually uh, quite close with the previous uh, global head of ETFs. Um, they have a, I think they've made 672 ETF applications in the history of BlackRock, they've had one fail. Um, so a very high hit rate. Um, they clearly know what they're doing. Uh, they're prepared. The SEC is obviously on the back foot post the grayscale loss. Um, and I think, yeah, we're going to see an approval very, very soon. And look, there's plenty of ETP products on the market here in Switzerland. We've got 21 shares. But the thing that everybody misses is when they make that point is that the 401k market in the US is trillions of dollars. And it basically can't invest in anything other than ETFs. Uh, when, you know, uh, so it can't have, invest in an ETN, it can't invest in grayscale ETC. They have to have an ETF. So this is why it's so important uh, for this approval. Obviously, I think everybody's got the joke that a futures ETF is a disaster because the funding of the futures is rolling and it's just bleeding into your product. It costs you, you know, the reason we make so much money in the hedge fund investments is because they're, they're trading the other side of these futures trades, right? So they're just taking that free money, which can be as high as, you know, in March 2020, we saw that basis blow out to like 80% annualized. So if you're trading a futures product to go long Bitcoin, you're you're getting absolutely destroyed through the fund. So a futures ETF is not fit for purpose. That's why a spot ETF is so important. And if it opens up that 401k market, you know, just a minuscule basis point percentage means billions of dollars in inflows into this market. Good. Maybe uh, then now I think you proposed uh, to discuss a bit the strategies you want to apply, and maybe I think this will be also interesting to learn something about this. Yeah, but as I said, we, we see a number of traditional hedge fund managers that have moved into crypto because the alpha that exists is so elevated compared to other markets. So what you've essentially done with crypto is you've built the entire infrastructure of markets all over again, right? Bitcoin trades on you know, 300 exchanges, 30 of which are potentially liquid. You've got OTC guys in that. You've got custodians. You've got DEXs, uh, centralized exchanges. So you've got liquidity just all over the place. And this leads to multiple avenues for arbitrage. So we think about our portfolio in about four key buckets. So we bucket market neutral with general arbitrage strategies. So trading the art on the basis of the futures, like I said. Um, mean reversion strategies. So you know we, we like a long short managers that can do me that are focused on mean reversion as opposed to fundamentals. We don't want a long short manager telling us I like Ethereum more than I like Polkadot. So I'm going to go long Ethereum and short Polkadot. Well, we all know that crypto is not logical the way that it trades at this point anyway. And that is a much more longer term strategy that we're waiting for. What we're looking for is mean reversion strategy. So historically, let's say Ethereum has always traded at a you know 25% premium to Polkadot. Okay, it's now blown out to 40% premium. Okay, that's a logical short by but uh, sell Ethereum by Polkadot, right? And edge into that trade. So you're looking at situations in the market that are, are sort of multiple standard deviations events from the normal mean um, uh, 
trajectory of those assets and then trading into um, that reversion trade. So we bucket all of those types of trades into our market neutral bucket. Uh, we then have, um, for more for the bear market, we have uh, fixed income type strategies. So we do uh, we do funds that have over collateralized lending uh, on centralized platforms. Um, fortunately, they avoided uh, all the uh, non collateralized lenders like uh, BlockFi and Celsius. Um, and they've actually got a very long track record. They've been operating for over six years, very consistent, twelve to fifteen percent return, volatility of one on the returns. Um, so you know that's what that's the sort of profile we have in that fixed income bucket. And we have market making. So we love market making as a strategy. As a traditional hedge fund investor, we can't invest in market making strategies. All market makers are really proprietary capital, Citadel Securities, Good Luck Investing, possible, Susquehanna, Jane Street, Jump, they're all private proprietary capital. But because of crypto's fragmentation, because that fragmentation means you need capital on Binance, you need capital on Kraken, you need capital on Bitfinex, Bittrex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's very capital intensive. So in this brief window, while we're growing this asset class, the market makers are, in some cases, open to external capital. So we really like that as a fund strategy because they make money um, really when things get very distressed. So you look at um, August, we did very well in the fund in August because we had market making strategies, even though Bitcoin and the rest of crypto was down somewhere around 12 percent or more, we did very well because the market making strategies, that's when they do very well. It's when you have high volume, bit of distress, people trading, crossing the spread, panicking, unwinding trades, it's very profitable. And then the final four uh, bucket that we have is um, the directional bucket, which we play with based on signals that Willie's seeing on chain. Um, and we use basically quant strategies, predominantly trend. Uh, for that directional piece. So when the when the market neutral bucket is paying us more money, we can lean a little bit more into trend because that market neutral bucket buffers our returns. As I said before, we don't ever want to have a drawdown month. So it's very important that any directionality we have in the portfolio is well protected by solid returns in the market neutral portfolio. So that's sort of a, a quick overview of the various different strategies. And uh, yeah, we're we're very excited. We find, I mean, when I had the last fund that I mentioned, we had a fund like this in my previous firm. Uh, it took us two and a half years to find seven investable managers. So to give you an indication of the maturing of the space since we launched that fund in 2019, today in 2023, it's taken us, obviously we've been researching the fund for a year now, but We've, we're live for four months. We're going to be 10 funds in the portfolio by the 1st of November. So it's uh, it's obviously showing that we're really seeing a maturation. Mm. And the key has been actually managers from the likes of Citadel, um, Brevin Howard, these very competent hedge fund managers moving over into crypto. Now, obviously, we love that because they understand what it means to be an institutionally investable manager. Perfect. Demilza, do you have anything to add? Uh, should we try to see if there's any questions from the audience or any uh, Maybe, participant yeah. questions? Does anyone uh, listening have a question for Richard? Where can they we find out some more? Three questions. I see some. Um, okay. No. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, here, Stefan was asking you, Richard, if you think or deals NFT on Bitcoin network, if they have a positive or a negative impact on the Bitcoin ecosystem. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I 
spent a lot of time thinking about it when it all sort of blew up and uh, the congestion that it created uh, on the Bitcoin network and obviously uh, the fee rise that we saw. Um, it was very, prof very profitable for the miners when the whole ordinal uh, phase was going nuts. Um, I think that, you know, you asked me a question before about crypto broadly and NFTs and is there value? And sure, there is. The fact that now the most decentralized network that exists in crypto has the ability to essentially have NFTs is interesting. It's certainly interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to say whether I think it's good or bad. I think, you know, the reason that I was first attracted to Bitcoin, as I said at the beginning, was because, you know, I was, I was interested in the hard money aspect. Um, do I need my gold to be able to have the functionality to draw pictures on it or uh, have people's property deeds on it? Not necessarily. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's it's a free and open network. Um, you can make whatever you want out of gold. Uh, you could choose to make a necklace or you can choose to store it as a gold bar in your vault. Um, if you choose to... Uh, change what, or, or imprint one of your Satoshis with an ordinal, um, then good luck to you. Um, I think that might end up identifying you on chain at some point. Um, so, you know, you've got to think about that. And obviously in a world of, you know, increasing authoritarianism across the globe, do you want to be linking your Bitcoin to your art collection? I don't know. I, I, I don't know what the right answer is. There are certainly greater minds than mine that have debated this subject. Um, I don't have a particularly strong view about it. I feel that, you know, Bitcoin is uh, how you want to use it. It's for your enemies as well as for your friends. Maybe we'll take one last question from David. Uh, is this the last question are we having here? And uh, he asks, of the four categories, which are the least saturated? Which one would you recommend um, as a quant manager with or with a quant manager focus on how to provide the best differentiation for investor? It's an excellent question, David. And the reason why we create the diversified portfolio is because in different market environments, you get different things that do well. Um, obviously, in a trending market, uh, a CTA manager will, will do very, very well. Uh, in a quiet market, you probably want to be leaning more towards the fixed income strategies. Um, in a volatile, high volume market, the market makers do extremely well. Um, but in quiet times, you know, remember, it's capital intensive. You've got a lot of infrastructure. If the volume's not there, it's, it can be a painful bleed. So I wouldn't say there's any one particular one, and that's exactly why we've constructed the portfolio the way we have to provide you a consistent return uh, through any type of environment. But it's a very good question. Okay, perfect. And now we have the closing question or question from Francois, and he asks <clears throat> if Seeds is only addressing their product, if Seeds Capital is only addressing their product to institutional asset manager uh, or is or or if also private banking clients are um, allowed to invest in these products um, so yeah look francois the the product is open to professional investors in switzerland it's a lot easier um, so, you know, obviously we can have discussions like this in Switzerland with Crypto Valley um, because it's it's open to professional investors. Um, in other jurisdictions, it can be a little bit more problematic. Obviously, more institutional investors uh, can participate pretty much from any jurisdiction. They're normally set up to be able to do so. Um, we don't have a U.S. feeder vehicle. At the moment, we do plan to launch one uh, when, once we hit 100 million in AUM. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not just for private bank clients. Of course, obviously, C's private bank clients do 
uh, invest in the product. We have other private banks as well, UBS, uh, UBP, uh, Quintet, Quintet Bank, who I hadn't heard of, but uh, they participate, and even SwissPro. Um, so the, the fund is available through SwissPro. Um, you have to um, be able to look it up, but yeah, it's, it's called Seas Crest. And um, yeah, it's, it's open. So it's not just for private bank clients. Great. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much, Demelsa. Thank you very much for everyone who attended. I hope you have learned something. I thought it's very, very interesting to talk to you, Richard. I mean, A, you have very strong convictions, uh, con convictions, but you have also the knowledge and the data which support it. It's not just as you have rightly mentioned it. I think you're a Bitcoin in enthusiast but it's really you have uh, well studied and well researched and you know it's a, um, I think it's a very honest opinion based on your knowledge and that makes it so valuable to talk to you thank you very much for the time and the insight you gave us thank you Martin thank thanks you. <laughs> bye bye everyone bye. have a good evening a very enjoyable Thank you. Thank you. Bye.